Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, family and friends on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. I want to welcome you to the ever increasing world feast, and I'm excited today to have all of you connected to this broadcast. Abel Damina is my name. We are very committed to the vision of reintroducing Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. Do me the favor today, invite somebody, share this video, tag somebody, you know, create watch parties, let's flood the entire Blue Marble planet with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. And I want you to know we're going to have an exciting time of studying the word of his grace on this particular broadcast today. Let me quickly mention that my two books are out. And if you don't have a copy of these books, I don't know what you're waiting for. Causes, Myth and the Truth. Very powerful material. You know, in this book, I talked about the language in which the Bible was written, use of words, the role of the Bible reader and the Bible teacher. The blessing and the curse, does God curse? The curse of the law, what of generational curses? Jesus and the fig tree and a lot more. It's a book you don't want to, you know, uh, go without, especially for people that have been threatened with curses before now. You know, what you don't know is bigger than you. Ignorance is the greatest undoing of any man. My people are destroyed not because Satan is powerful, but because they don't know. They have no knowledge. So get this material today. It will build you up and edify you and bring clarity. Then there's this other book on the communion table. Many people ask me so many questions on the communion, you know, and all of that. This book is very powerful. I wrote this book and there's a lot in it. Exegesis all over the book. The promise of God, the Old Testament feast, the difference between the Passover, breaking of bread, and the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, and walking in love. Very powerful material. I'd like you to order for them, you know, and all other books that we have written. All of these efforts is to see that you are enriched in your work with Christ, that you maximize everything that Christ has provided for your spiritual edification. I'd like you to share with other people, you know, the things we are sharing with you here. Get more people to be connected. Get more people to order for the material. Right now on the screen, the phone number to call for the material is on the screen and the email address where you can send your orders to is also on the screen. There are also many other titles. I have written over 30 titles you can order and our office can send you all of the catalogs for it. Now, let me also mention, those of you that have been following my teachings who don't have a local church where you attend, where Christ is revealed, God wants you to live among brethren. God doesn't want you to be isolated. The Bible says God has placed the solitary in families. The word of God tells you, I will bring you to your fold and I will give you pastors according to my heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And he says, it shall come to pass that when you are fed, you shall not lack, you shall not fear, you shall not be dismayed. If you are in a location where there's no Bible teaching church, where Christ is revealed all the time, you've been following my teachings and you want to identify with one or you want to start a campus. We call our churches campuses. You want to start a campus. All you need to do is send me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. We will equip you and train you and work together with you to create a campus in your locality so you become a lighthouse where other people seeking to know Christ can come around and be part of the fellowship and you can be pioneering a church there that will bring light to that community. You become a lighthouse in that society. I'm really excited about the opportunity God has given us as a ministry to enrich and equip believers all over the nations of the earth. Just before we go into the service, remember again that you need a pen, a notebook, and a Bible because it's going to be an exciting adventure as we adventure together into the word of his grace. My prayer for you today is that grace abound towards you, that you always have sufficiency in all things. You abound unto every good work in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me mention, the study we're going to be having the next one, two weeks here on 
Facebook, YouTube every evening at 6 p.m. GMT plus one. The study we're going to be having is going to be a Bible school. We want to equip you and train you in the pursuit of the kingdom assignment that God has for your life. I want to encourage you every day at this same time, 10 p.m. GMT plus one to get more people to be part of this broadcast so together we can lighten the dark places of the earth. Let me take you on a gospel adventure right now into that service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. The book of John chapter 5 verse 39, Jesus speaking said, Search the scriptures to the Jews, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So we said that um, what makes a book accepted as part of the scriptures is that that book carries with it the center of his message as Christ. What makes it canon of scripture is that it is speaking concerning Christ. Any book that is not speaking concerning Christ disqualifies from being scripture. What makes any book of the Bible scripture is that the central theme of that book is Jesus. It's Christocentric. And that's why Jesus said the scriptures testify of me. Verse 40 says, but you will not come to me that you might have life. So we've established that life is in a person. Life is a person. Jesus is life. We read the scriptures because they testify of Jesus, but we encounter Jesus to have life. John chapter 10, he says, I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The book of John tells us he that has a son has life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the life. Life is a person. The person of Jesus. And then we began to look at that, that therefore it will mean that the book of Galatians has a central theme as Jesus. Because no book is accepted as canon of scripture if the central theme of that book is not Jesus. Because the entire Bible is the book of Jesus. So it will mean therefore that the book of Galatians is the message of the Christ. The book of Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Paul writes into the church at Galatia and he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You are removed from him. You are so soon removed from him. Him that called you into the grace of Christ. So your calling is into the grace of Christ. Meaning the gospel is the grace of Christ. Anything that is not the grace of Christ is not the gospel. It's pseudo gospel. The gospel is the grace of Christ. And Paul says to the people at Galatia, you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another. Unto another. So if it is not the grace of Christ, it is another. And I have decided not to waste my time paying attention to people who are preaching another. Because it's just a matter of time, it will collapse. It will collapse. I'm not, it's not a bother to me at all. It's a matter of time it will collapse and actually it's already collapsing. You know, there was a time what they call the gospel in this country was just motivation. People come to church to be motivated. You will make it. You will succeed. You will get there. You will overtake. You will arrive. That's all. If our hope is only in this world, we are of all men most miserable. And today the motivational speaking saga is gone. Then prophecy came all over the place. Everybody suddenly became a prophet, even those that are not even part of the fivefold office. Everybody became a prophet. Everybody is trying to prophesy. It has collapsed. It's gone. That's how all of them are collapsing. There's only one thing that will not collapse. The gospel of Christ. The grace of God. The message of the grace of God. Hallelujah. I said Hallelujah. The book of that Galatians chapter 1 verse 7. It says another gospel which is not another. Anything that is not the grace of Christ is not gospel. Which is not another. 
He said, there will be some that will trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. So any message that is not the grace of Christ is a perversion or a trouble to the believer. It's a perversion or a trouble to the believer. There was a time where what they called the gospel in this country was just success motivation. People come to church to be taught keys to success. How to succeed. How to make it. 25 irrevocable laws of success. 40 steps to success. 15 keys to success. All that. And that was gospel. That's another which is not another. Teaching good. The message is the grace of Christ. Look, the body of Christ, we don't have messages. The Bible only has one message, one character. One message, one character. It, it, it's not like uh, 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 some people are gifted in success. Some people are gifted in motivation. You just preach your own. Your own is Christ. Uh -uh. No book of the Bible is canon of scripture if its central message is not Christ. So anybody preaching success as the message is a fraud. That's fraud. There's only one message. And that's Christ. Outside Christ is fraud. It's secularism in the name of Christianity. It's actually humanistic. It's actually humanistic. Any unbeliever can teach you how to succeed. Any secular person who is, who is an idol worshiper can motivate you. The best motivators are unbelievers. And they're in America. If they talk to you, you will dash them your leg. They are very good in motivation. They're unbelievers. They don't know Jesus. It's secularism. It's humanism. Humanistic. But the gospel is the power of God. And what makes it gospel is the person in it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? What makes it the gospel is the person in it. Christ. That's what makes it the gospel. The grace of Christ. What Christ has done. What Christ has made available. What Christ has provided. The gift of grace. Jesus, the grace of God. Embodied as the love of God. Expressed, dispensed. To mankind. If it's not Christ. It's another gospel. I don't care who is preaching it. This thing is beyond personalities. Paul said. Look at it. Look at it. Which is not another. But there will be some that trouble you. And will pervert the gospel of Christ. Next verse. But though we. But though we. It has no respect for personalities. But though we. Or an angel from heaven. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, which is the grace of Christ. Let him be our cause. It has no regard for the cap on that man's head, nor the chain on his neck, nor the title on his body. If he likes, let him be in the ministry since the days of Martin Luther. It does not change anything. If it is not the gospel of Christ, it's a fallacy. It's a fallacy. Now, this is why Paul wrote the book of Galatians. He wrote it because the Galatian church had compromised. They had been swept off from the gospel of Christ to another. So he came back to them to align them back to the message. Because if you don't stay with this message, before you know it, you're already talking like you have never had it. This thing, you don't hear it once and run away. You stay with it. And you pay attention steadily. That's the way to stay with it. Pastor Gift was with me here this week. We were talking. And I said to him, in fact, if you don't have people you fellowship with in this message, if you stay alone, if you are not careful, you can even be distracted. You can even compromise. You have to have a company. You have to have a company where you steadily go to fellowship. We are all of you are minding the same thing. So as you keep fellowshipping around it, you grow in it. That's why you have the local church. And that's why every time you come here, that's what you're hearing. Are we together here? Yeah. 
He said, there'll be some. He said, though we are an angel from heaven, not an angel from a, from a village, from heaven. He has no respect for personalities. The message does not regard people. I will show you in a few minutes. Next verse. As we said before, so say I now again. Double emphasis. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. We said it before, we repeat it again. That's how serious the matter is. Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. Only the word of God is forever. First Peter 1.25 but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. This is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Then Galatians 1.10, look at Paul now talking. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If I'm preaching to gain men's approval, then God didn't call me. Oh, in the course of preaching this message, I have lost many friends. I have lost many friends. I've lost associations. I've lost relationships. It doesn't mean anything to me. A number of people have have called me names and called me all kinds of things. Changes nothing. I'm fully persuaded. I'm fully persuaded. If I lose the whole world, I'm satisfied. It changes nothing. Believe me. Hmm. Believe me. There are pastors that have sworn I will never preach in their church. Who needs their pulpit? Who needs their pulpit? Don't I have my own? Who is looking for their pulpit? I have my own pulpit. If I want, I can do church every day here and keep preaching till I'm tired. What is it? Leave that thing. Leave that thing. Look, Power City, I'm fully persuaded. This is the end of discussion. The gospel of Christ. Amen. Am I teaching here? Please, this is very important. Some people left this church because they don't like what we're teaching. It's not just friends, we've lost members. Members who came for stomach infrastructure. Whose God is their belly. So because we are no more preaching, you will make it. You will succeed. You will get it. 15 steps to making it. How to become a billionaire. How? We are not teaching those things. We are just teaching Christ. They left. Because they didn't come for him. They came for it. They came for it. Not for him. Those who came for him. This is the time they stay well. Because yes, that's what they came for. Those who came for it. Will look for a reason to live. Because what they came for. Is not available. It's not only us it has happened to. It happened to Jesus. It happened to Jesus. Everybody followed Jesus. When he was doing miracles. When he was doing signs and wonders, everybody followed him. When he was feeding them with bread and fish, they all followed him. When he started teaching doctrine, they left. Look at it, John chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back. Many of his disciples went back. Not some, many. Many of his followers, his members, went back and walked no more with him. Why did they go back? Watch. This is why they left Jesus. Verse 41 of John chapter 6. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Because he said, that means why they left was doctrine. 
They left him on doctrinal grounds because of what he was teaching, because of what he was saying. That's why they left. Okay? He said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Next verse. And they said, it's not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? Doctrine. That was their problem. Next verse. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the father which had sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. They were still looking at him. Next verse. It is written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that had heard and had learned of the father cometh unto me. Not that any man had seen the father, save he which is of God, he has seen the father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. I am. The bread is not oven baked. It's a person. I am that bread of life. Next verse. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Your fathers ate manna. And they thought they ate manna from heaven. No, it's not from heaven. It's in the wilderness. Your fathers ate manna. They thought it was from heaven. Watch this next verse. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. The one your fathers ate didn't come from heaven. This is the one that came down from heaven. That a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread. Which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread. He shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. Which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? It's doctrine. Their problem was doctrine. In one service. One message. Sent many members back in. In one service. One message. Sent many members packing. Next verse. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living father has sent me, and I live by the father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. This thing said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. This was the teaching, doctrine, the teaching. Next verse. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? Are you offended by my teaching? What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Jesus is giving them a new reality here. Okay? Watch this. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not and who shall betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it was given unto him of my father. Next verse. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why did they go back? Because of what he said. Because of what he said. When he was doing miracles, nobody went back. When he was giving bread and fish, nobody went. When he started teaching doctrine, centered on his death, burial, and resurrection, they left. They left. And that's why when you hear the kind of things we teach here, you must be careful who you form alliances with. Because if you are not careful, you will soon start compromising. You, you soon start compromising. You still start saying, all oh, this Christ, Christ, Jesus, Jesus, that Papa is preaching, said, oh, it's too much. Can't we talk about other things? 
The country is going through recession. Papa should teach us how to develop ideas for business. Go to Uyo Business School. Didn't you know when you were coming inside this place that the place is called Power City? What is power? Where the word of a king is. So where are you coming to? You're coming to the word of a king. Which king? The king of the universe. What is his name? Jesus. What will you hear? Jesus. That's what you're here to hear. Say, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. How can Coca-Cola employ you and you advertise seven up? You're working for Coca-Cola. You're wearing Coca-Cola ID card and you're advertising seven up. How can Jesus employ you and instead of advertising Jesus, you're advertising success? Or Moses. You're wearing Jesus ID card and you're carrying Moses banner. That's a rebel. Who is that? I'm not just a rebel, he's a fraud. That man is a fraud. Because he's, 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 he's stealing from Coca-Cola and he's advertising 7 up. He's fraudulent. He's not honest. How can Jesus employ me to preach him and I preach something else? I have nothing else to preach other than him. That's why Paul said, I marvel that you are so, so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. This book was a, this is one of Paul's very rough books. This book is very rough. Inside this book, he kept calling people foolish without thinking. It's a very rough book. The guy, <laughs> this is an apostolic koboko. Brother Paul was not playing games here. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. They left because of what he taught. They didn't last. Amen. I say, amen. Doctrinal persuasion. That was their dividing line. That was their point of quarrel. See? Galatians 1 11. Then look at Paul now talking. For I certify, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the revelation of Paul is the revelation of Jesus Christ. What Paul is preaching and teaching is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the word of God. But before he goes into the teaching, as soon as he made that announcement, he gave us his history. He gave us his history. You don't just listen to a man of God preach whose history you don't know. There is protocol. You must know his protocol. He gave his history. Look at it in verse 13. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. You have heard. Look at the next verse. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation. Being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. I was zealous of the traditions of my father. You have heard about me. How I was zealous. How I made profit to the Jewish religion. How I did everything to protect and defend tradition. And what does Jesus say about tradition? In Mark chapter 7 verse 13. Look at what Jesus said about tradition. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. Which you have delivered. And many such like things do ye. Tradition. Demons cannot make the word of God of none effect. There's only one thing that can make the word of God ineffective. Tradition. Tradition. When you are too traditional in your thinking, you leave the substance of the word and pursue the shadows. Tradition is when a man celebrates shadows beyond substance. You romance the shadows and you ignore the substance. Tradition. Practices. What is tradition? A body of knowledge that people have accepted over time. A body of knowledge that people have accepted over time. 
And that's why we teach the way we do in this church to drive completely away traditions that contradict the word of God. Tradition makes the word of God of none effect. Even Satan was not given that reputation. It's tradition that has that reputation. So Paul began to tell his story. He said, I'm a Pharisee as touching the law, blameless. You know, for you to be a Pharisee, number one, you must be able to recite the Torah by heart. That is, you must know the Old Testament such that without consulting any book, you can recite any part of the Torah. And then a Pharisee is one that has kept the law of Moses. Kept the law of Moses. And Paul said, look, I am a Pharisee. As touching the law, I am blameless. I have no blame. I'm above my equals in the religion of being a Pharisee. Who are Pharisees? They were the archbishops of that time. People like Nicodemus. People like Paul. These, are, these, were, these were Pharisees. In fact, Paul said, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm their father. Legalistic. You know, the rich, the, the rich young ruler too was a Pharisee. The rich young ruler. I'm teaching here. These are Pharisees. You can have the law. You can have tradition. You can have religion. But you don't have Jesus. You can have the law. You can have tradition. You can have religion. But you don't have Jesus. That's what Paul was establishing. Paul was establishing that I am a religious person, I keep the law, and I observe traditions, but I don't know Jesus. And a man can be in that category even in this service. You know, yeah, even in this service. You keep the law, you know, you are traditionally excellent, you know, and you are a Pharisee. You are very religious, but you don't know Christ. You can sing all the songs and quote all the hymns. You know the SS and S, sacred songs and solo. But you don't know Jesus. <laughs> it's a serious matter. Amen. Paul said, I was so zealous that I killed people for religion. I was killing people in the name of religion. That's how zealous I was, Paul spoke. Verse 15. But when he pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, to reveal Jesus in me, that I might preach him among the hidden, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I conferred not with flesh and blood. When he was talking about separation from his mother's womb, what he was saying is I was separated from my natural generation. From my natural generation. Meaning I became a new creation. I'm called by his grace. Why? Salvation is by grace. He's telling his life story to reveal his son in me. He said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. What Paul was saying is, I didn't come out from the blues. You can trace my history. You can trace my record. You can see where I'm coming from to be what I am. Amen. I said, amen. Amen. A, man, a certain man in Nigeria. Many people get confused about him. And some have concluded that he's a man of God. The only way we can tell whether he's a man of God or not is by going to his history. Going where? That's why it's good to have history. So the first question asked him is, when did you get born again since you're a man of God? Because the man just emerged out of the blues. Bam! So they asked him, when did you get born again? He said, from my mother's womb. That means he's not born again. He's not born again. There must be a specific day as you arrive at the age of accountability where you had the message unconsciously you accepted Christ. There must be that day. Nobody is born again from his mother's womb. 
Jesus told Nick, except a man be born. A what? Not a boy. A man. A man be born. That's why Nicodemus said, how can a man be born? A man be born. How can a man be born? He was thinking in terms of natural. And Jesus was talking in terms of spiritual. And they asked the man, okay, okay, no argument. We agree, you are born again from a mother's womb. When did you receive the call to ministry? He said, I was born like that. When somebody talks like that, you know that that person, <laughs> that person is far from Christ. Amen? I said amen. That's why Paul took time in Galatians chapter 1 to first of all establish his history, where it's coming from. He said, I didn't just fall from the blues. You know where I'm coming from. I was so zealous. I was keeping the law. I was blameless in the law. I was so zealous, I killed Christians. I up upheld the tradition that was handed me. Now you don't just read any book just because the book has Jesus on it. Before you read a book, you've got to find out. This person that wrote this book, where is he coming from? You know, you, you've got to find out because that is where some people receive another gospel in a subtle manner. Very subtle. Inculcated in teachings that you cannot ascertain where it is coming from. You've got to stay with the truth that you have received here and stay with the truth that is in Christ Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. Galatians chapter 1 verse 17. Look at Paul speaking now. He said, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none save James, the lost brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. 23. But they had had only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the faith which once he destroyed. 24. And they glorified God in me. The news went all over the place that the man that was killing Christians is now preaching the gospel. But many of them never saw him. Many of the apostles never saw him. He said, I saw Peter and I saw James, the lost brother. Those were the only people I had contact with. And in fact, it's only Peter that I stayed with for 15 days. Only. That's why he said, the gospel I preached, nobody taught me. None of them. Because me and them never had any meeting. We never had any conference. Then he said, the gospel I'm preaching came to me by the revelation of Jesus Christ. From where? From the scriptures of the prophets. Paul's revelation was not from the sky. Paul's revelation was from the Old Testament. He, he studied the Old Testament. And out of the Old Testament, Jesus was revealed to him. It is that revelation that came to Paul from the Old Testament that he now communicated as the revelation of Jesus drawn out of the mystery to bring the epistles. Am I teaching here? It was not Paul that created the revelation. No, no, no. He took it out of the scriptures of the prophets. Because no scripture is of any private interpretation. But holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Old Testament, therefore, was written by men that were under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So when Paul came, because he too was under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, when he read the writings of the prophets... Jesus came alive. I'm communicating here. Who came alive? Where did he come alive from? From the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament is Jesus concealed. But that concealed Jesus is revealed to Paul. And Paul unveiled him in the epistles. Which is the rightly divided word of truth. How did Paul call the epistles? Please stay with me. Are you still here? If you're still here, touch your neighbor. Say, stay here, stay here, stay here. I'm your pastor. Romans 16, 25. 
Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. What is that gospel? This is Paul talking. Which is the revelation or the preaching of Jesus Christ? Which preaching of Jesus Christ? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to what? According to the revelation. Not the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the gospels. But the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation. Why not according to the Gospels? Because the Gospels were eyewitness accounts. And of course, eyewitness accounts are limited. Did you hear that? What did I say? Eyewitness accounts. That's why Paul, I mean, Mark will say it one way. Luke will say it another way. Because it's limited. This is what we saw. So Paul didn't preach it according to the Gospels. He preached it according to the revelation of the mystery. What is the mystery? What is the mystery? The Old Testament. The Old Testament is the mystery. The preaching of Paul was according to the revelation of the mystery. The revelation of the Old Testament. The revelation of the mystery. Is that in your Bible? Of the mystery. Which was kept what? Secret when? Since the world began. So Paul preached according to the revelation of Jesus. The preaching of Paul was the revelation of Jesus. Again, the preaching of Paul was the revelation of Jesus. Pay attention. Hallelujah. In these scriptures that we just read, Paul was making a clear distinction. Between his ministry and what was obtainable in Jerusalem. A clear distinction of what was going on in Jerusalem and his ministry. He was making a clear distinction. Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. Jerusalem was like the council of Christianity. That is where all apostles went. In Acts chapter 8, when there was persecution, everybody was scattered from Jerusalem. Only the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 8. Because Jerusalem was the headquarter of Christianity. Every apostle assembled in Jerusalem. Even in the heat of persecution, the apostles stayed back in Jerusalem. And Paul said, I never went to Jerusalem to go and learn from them. I didn't go to the apostles. I was not in Jerusalem. Where was Paul? He was in Antioch. Huh? He was where? Saul of Tarsus. He was not in Jerusalem with them. That's why I said the gospel I'm preaching is not after man. Man didn't give me this thing. It came by the revelation of Jesus. Praise God. Paul said what I preach is not after man. In fact, if you study carefully, Paul only visited Jerusalem five times. Only five times. He only visited. He didn't even stay there. He just visited five times. To establish further that what is preaching, man, they didn't teach him. Because all apostles were assembled there. And he was not there. Meaning that what he preached was different from what they were preaching. Are you here? What this guy was preaching is different from what all of them were preaching. Let's look at the five times Paul visited Jerusalem. The five times. The first time was in Acts chapter 9 verse 19. Put it up for me. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, It's not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying in wait was not of Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. 
And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, that was the first time he came to Jerusalem. By the time he came to Jerusalem, he had started preaching Christ. That means the revelation of Jesus was already at work. He didn't go to Jerusalem to learn. He went to Jerusalem to preach. Okay? Now he was preaching in Damascus. And when they heard that the man that was killing people is preaching Christ, the very Christ, they teamed up that we must kill him. We must kill him. And they put surveillance on him day and night. And when the disciples saw that they wanted to kill him, they took him and put him through the window. He escaped. And when he escaped, where did he escape to? Safe zone. Where is safe zone? Jerusalem. Why? That's where all the apostles are gathered. I'm teaching here. That was his first time in Jerusalem. And he came there already armed with the message of Christ. While all of them were preaching Moses. All of them were preaching Moses. Now watch this. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he assayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Even the apostles, all of them, they were afraid. So how could he have learned from them? Somebody afraid of you, how will he even listen to you? That's why I said the message I'm preaching. I didn't receive it from man. It was not revealed to me by man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where? According to the scriptures of the prophets. Are you still here? If you're hearing me, say, I hear you. And then look at verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him. And how he had preached boldly at Damascus. How did he preach? In the name. So his message was centered on Christ. From the beginning. And what happened when he was introduced to them by Barnabas? Verse 29. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew. They brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. What kind of life is this? Everywhere he goes, the moment he starts preaching, they want to kill him. Brethren will sneak him and dispatch him. Then when he comes again, instead of him to keep quiet, he will start preaching. When you carry this message, you can't keep quiet. Any one of you in this church that is still worried and afraid of evangelism, you don't know Jesus. Touch your neighbor, say, Papa said, Papa. you don't know Jesus. If you are still afraid to talk about him. What are you talking about? This man was preaching Jesus everywhere. Then they will plan to kill him. He's seen the plan. They will sneak him and take him to a safe zone. Instead of making the place safe, he will start preaching Christ again. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of this message. That's why Paul said I didn't receive it of anybody. So it has no respect of persons. When I preach it, I don't look at your face. You are not important where the message is concerned. And if it blasts you, repent. If it, if, it, if, if, if it hits you, repent. Don't fight it. If you fight it, you wound yourself. It is hard to kick your legs against the pricks. You can't fight this message. If you're fighting it, it's just a display of ignorance. After a while, the message will break you. Because he that falls on the rock shall be broken to pieces. He that the rock fall upon. So whichever way you are the one that will either lose or gain. So just make up your mind to line up with the message. Say I hear you. Just line up with the message. Just line up with the message. The second time Paul went to Jerusalem was Acts 11.23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Next verse. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. That means Saul was in Tarsus. So Barnabas went to go and look for Paul. Who was Barnabas? One of the senior apostles before Paul got born again. But the sinner apostle humbled himself and went to look for Paul. Obviously, the last time they were together, Paul said some things that started affecting Barnabas. Barnabas was beginning to consider some of the Pauline thoughts. Okay, next verse. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. 
And it came to pass that a whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So the beginning of Christianity was with the teaching of Paul. Christianity started with the Pauline teaching. It was out of that teaching that Christians were reproduced. If you want to produce genuine Christians, you must bring them face to face with the revelation of Paul. Am I teaching here? Yeah. That was the first time they were recording a group of people who reflected Christ. Christians means people that look like Christ. And it was the teaching of Paul. For one year, he was teaching Christ, teaching Christ. And in the course of that teaching, the people were conformed to Christ. That they had no option than to reflect him. Christianity remains a caricature until you come face to face with the teachings of Christ. Am I communicating here? Yeah. This is the first time they were calling people Christians. After Paul has spent one year in Antioch, teaching and teaching, teaching and teaching, teaching and teaching, for one full year. Hallelujah. Whoo! Look at verse 27. And in those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. Now, honey, everybody was coming to Antioch. Everybody, prophets. Paul had raised the standard. It's no more Christianity as usual. Just like the world is beginning to come to you. It's no more religion. We are not doing religion here. We are unveiling Christ. See, I hear. Everybody was coming to Antioch. Antioch became a place of pilgrimage for the knowledge of Christ. We are blessed as a church, man. Look at the next verse, 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Now it was time to send relief, food, clothes, and all of that. And what happened? Which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So now, Paul is in, involved in welfare. Paul, they gathered food and clothes and gave to Paul. And Paul took it to Judea to go and give the brethren. To go and help. There must have been a situation that created the need for welfare. And the church in Antioch gathered material. And through brother Paul, that is true Christianity. When Jesus begins to be reflected in your life, the love of God in your heart begins to consider the needs of others. You sit down with a brother in church and you perceive that his body is producing a particular order you don't like. Instead of doing your face one kind and looking at him as the devil, within the week, buy a perfume. As you see him next Sunday, and you shake him. Tell him I have something for you. Bless him with it. Bless him with it. I'm teaching now. Begin to think about people. You see a brother is wearing a cloth that is not good. You have some clothes you are no more using. Tell him brother come. Can you visit my house? Let's have lunch. You prepare food. Two of you eat. You talk about the message. You pray together. You fellowship together. When he's about to go, you tell him, there are some clothes I have. I don't know if they will fit you. Can you try them? He tries them. They fit. You package it well for him. You send him with it responsibly. That's the love of Christ. Not that you look at him and say, hmm. Meanwhile, you have clothes that are lying ways. You have not known Christ. You have not known Christ. When you begin to see Christ, the next thing he start producing in you is that you start thinking about your brothers because we are members of the same body. If a brother is not well dressed, it is me that is not well dressed. If a sister's mouth is smelling, maybe she has not eaten for two days. So instead of looking at what, because when we say shout fire, she looks at us and says fire. You say fire for this fire is too hot. <laughs> so <laughs> instead of twisting your head, tell her we're going for lunch. Immediately the service is over. We're going for lunch together. Amen. This is serious gospel here. Immediately the service is over. We are going for lunch. Amen. 
And if they are disturbing you too much, come to church with sweets. Come to church with sweets in your pocket. If that disturbs you a lot and distracts you from hearing the message, bring solution in your pocket. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> it's a serious matter. Relief materials. <laughs> Bring with you relief material to the service. So that when you, a brother says, hey, and you don't like what you're coming out, open your own face, put in your mouth. They tell him, you care for. <laughs> it's called the law of kindness. <laughs> That's to say, it's not only you, my brother. Me too, I'm, I'm refreshing my, take and let's be partakers. Teaching good? Because some of you, the way you used to look at some people, I used to see you. Just look at him and then you draw one kind. But it's so unfortunate that there's not enough space to draw much. <laughs> so you cure the problem. They brought relief materials. <laughs> you people in this service. <laughs> Praise God. So Paul brought relief materials. That was the second visit. Okay. The third visit was Acts 12.25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark, John Mark. Now they were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lysias of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Even Brother Paul was in this service. He was part of this. So Paul's ministry did not begin in Jerusalem. He visited Jerusalem. He didn't learn from the brethren before him. The fourth visit of Paul to Jerusalem is in Acts 15 verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Hey! Next verse. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and did I tell you before that at that time Barnabas was already shifting grounds? So you can see now Barnabas is following Paul and defending the message of Paul. He has humbled himself. He's defending what Paul is preaching because he's been converted and persuaded. And certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So when the quarrel started, they now say, let's go to Jerusalem and settle the matter. That was the fourth time they now went to Jerusalem and James presided over that council. Brother James, the elder, the pastor of the church, the general overseer at that time, he presided over that meeting. And when he presided over that meeting, certain conclusions were reached. That, okay, from now, let the Gentiles be part of us. Only let them not do one, two, three, four. They still brought legalism into it. They still brought legalism. Since we cannot stop them from receiving Holy Ghost, even though they are not circumcised. But even though they are not circumcised, let's give them some things if they are going to be part of us. Trying to set human standards. Legalism is very wicked. Alright? Then the fifth time Paul visited Jerusalem was in Acts 21 verse 15. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. And there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one man son of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. So that was the fifth time Paul went to Jerusalem. Okay, And this was where there was a prophecy that he should not go to Jerusalem. That the man that has this girdle, when he goes to Jerusalem, he will be bound. And Paul said, I am ready to be bound and even to die. I'm not moved by those things. Those prophecies will not stop me from going. I'm committed to this message. Amen. I said amen. I said amen. And in none of these visits, from the things we have read, there was none of them where he went and they taught him. There was none where he went and all of them sat him down to teach him. So he didn't learn from Jerusalem. He, that's why he said, neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Can somebody shout hallelujah. And you know, in our day today, some people, when you don't receive training from them, they don't give you right hand of fellowship. That is unscriptural. They will treat you like a leper because you are not part of their clique. That's not scriptural. The apostles were doing their own thing. When they saw what Paul was teaching, they submitted their own teachings to Brother Paul. 
They accepted Paul's teaching. So Paul didn't teach Peter. I mean, Peter didn't teach Paul. James didn't teach Paul. That's what Paul meant by, he says, look, what I'm teaching, I neither received it of anybody, nor was I taught it. In fact, look at what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 verse 1. You know, we're dealing with the book of Galatians. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. Now, that means Titus has also been brought to the camp of Brother Paul. He said, I took Titus with me. We went back to Jerusalem 14 years after. Now look at what came out of it. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them, which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. That is why apostles, apostles should have a forum where they meet and an apostle who has this revelation is permitted to teach. I belong to a few of them like that. I belong to a few apostolic bodies where we gather from time to time and we raise up doctrinal issues and we sit down and deliberate over it. We expansiate and everybody explains what light he has as pertaining that issue. And at the end of the day, we pray and we all disperse. Are you with me here? Yeah, I belong to a few like that. That's how apostles should meet. Apostles should meet from time to time and fellowship around doctrine. It, it, it's necessary. That was how Paul was. You see, this trip that Paul is talking about where he said, I went to Jerusalem by revelation, was a trip where they sent him to take relief materials. So when he went to the relief materials, while they were busy giving people relief, he met privately with the apostles. They met in a private meeting. We are Paul taught them his message. We are Paul shared with them the message of the grace of God. The revelation of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Are you in the house? Yeah. That's how apostles ought to meet and fellowship and learn. So that another gospel does not take over the church. But we are here, we have a commitment to Jesus. Another gospel will not any longer take over the church. Paul said, I didn't receive it of any man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know? And if you observe, Paul was going all over the place, bringing the message of Christ, unveiling Christ to the people. We have only one message. The message is Christ. We have only one revelation. The revelation is Christ. Our mission as a church is to see him and in him see ourselves. When you see him, you know that what is in him is in you. Hallelujah. I prophesy to the first 1,000 of you whose amen will come like thunder, you will demonstrate Jesus to your generation. <laughs> Lift your right hand and say, I am in him. <laughs> say where he is, I am. What he has, I have. What he can do, I can do. What did Jesus do when he was on earth? He rebuked the winds and the wave. What can you do today? Say, I rebuke the winds and the waves. Say, and they obey me. When Jesus was here, what did he do? He opened blind eyes. And what happened to the eyes? They were opened. What about you? Somebody say, as he is, so am I. What he has, I have. What he can do, I can do. He cannot be defeated. I cannot be defeated. I thought somebody would stand up and say, everything obeys me. The way it obeyed Jesus. I thought I would hear a powerful amen. amen. When Jesus was on earth, look at me for a minute everybody. When Jesus was on earth, how many of you know he never prayed in Jesus' name? Jesus never prayed in Jesus' name. He never said, Father, in the name of Jesus. Did you see that in your Bible? How did he pray? Father, I thank you because when he opened blind eyes, did you open them in Jesus' name? What did he say? He says to them, what do you want? They say, sight. And what did he say? Receive. There was, he didn't put Jesus' name. When he met the lame, 
What did he say to them? Rise up, take your mat, go. Why? Why didn't he use his name? He was his name. He himself was the name. And what he was doing was revealing to you what you also are capable of doing in his name. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, how many names must bow? Of things where? Where? Where else? So, how many realms does the name control? Three realms. Heaven, earth, under the earth. Where is the name cancer? Is it in heaven? Where is it? And what has authority over cancer? The name of Jesus. Where is the name high blood pressure? Where is it? In heaven? And the name of Jesus has authority over every name where? On earth. So when the name cancer stands and the name Jesus stands, which one swallows which? When the name high blood pressure, high blood pressure, but there is a name that is above. As I'm speaking, high blood pressure is crashing. Sugar diabetes is crashing. As I'm speaking, tumors are melting out. Melting, melting, melting. Fibroids are disappearing. They are disappearing. Bone disease is bowing down. Cold is bowing down. Pneumonia is running out. If your amen is louder, receive it manifested. Let me ask you, when Jesus was here and he prayed for the sick, was there any account of the sick not getting healed? In this service, everybody with any ailment in your body, you are healed. Those of you watching on television, on Facebook, you are healed. I command bones that are weak. I command heart that is weak. I command liver that is affected. I command kidneys that are infected. I flush out the infections. I give out shitala. Bronda gasonda gada gado go. Open your mouth, blasting tongues. Let the quickening of the Holy Ghost stir it up, stir it up. Blow, blow, blow in tongues. Roko tonaka. Hila ba rokete ne kika kaka kaka. Jado do do do. Hila ba 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 ba. Rondange. Speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. Hey! Put your hands on your head, your two hands. Everything that is not of God, make it noise in your body. I flush out. 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 In the name of Jesus. I command every oppression, every demonic oppression, break your holes. Depression, go. Go, go, go. In the name of Jesus. Numbness, be flush out. Be flush out. Be flush out. Be flush out. Body be healed. Zadumango no jake, Mrenanzo tolada, Broyana kotonaga, Block tubes be flushed, Be flushed, be flushed, I command low sperm count, Infertility, be healed right now, Receive a miracle, A miracle, A miracle over your body, I break the yoke of fear, I break the yoke of fear, The spirit of fear, Go in the name of Jesus, all over this atmosphere, on television, on the internet, on Facebook, wherever you're watching the service, be healed in your body. Be healed in your finances. Be healed in your body. Be healed in your body. Quickly, do, do something, do something, do something. Do something. Move your body. Do something.
Do something. Do something. If there was a condition, do something against that condition. If something wrong in your body, do something against that condition. You are taking it by force. You are, you are take by shotananga. The price is paid. The devil has no right to stay in that body. Zimo lagada. Now put your hands in your pocket. If you have a handbag, grab it. Money. I command a traffic of money into your hands. I'm not hearing that. Amen. Receive jobs. Receive appointments. Receive employments. Receive contracts. Receive checks. Receive monies. Receive opportunities. Receive favor. This week, receive a traffic of money. I say receive a traffic of money. Receive, receive, receive. Receive, receive. Receive, receive. In the name of Jesus. Where people forgot you. Your checks that have been lying down. Your money's in the hands of people who have the money to pay but have decided to be wicked. I generate situations that will force them to pay you. By the power of God, produce in this place the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. There are righteous men all over this house. Make it power available. We generate power right now and we make it difficult for men to keep your money. We make it difficult. We make it difficult. We make it difficult. This afternoon, receive miracle phone calls. Tomorrow, receive checks. Receive signed checks. Receive signed checks. People will look at you and like you and pay your rent. They will look at you and like you and dash you a house. They will look at you and like you and give you a car. Take, 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 take. The man knows they're killing him. The set time to favor Zion has come. Somebody shout favor. Shout it five times. Two, three, four, five. Zago dajekelene mosata. You will enter into some offices this week and it will be the beginning of a new journey. Take it, take it, take it. Who am I talking to? I said take it. I hear a sound of abundance. All over this church, I hear a sound of abundance. All over this church, I hear a sound of abundance. All over this church, I hear a sound of abundance. Those of you watching on Facebook, on the internet, receive that sound of abundance. Thank you, my father. Thank you, my father. Lift your hands and give thanks. Go ahead, give him thanks, give him praise. Give him thanks, give him praise. See what God is bringing and begin to rejoice. I'm not hearing your rejoicing. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It's been an adventure together, studying and learning the things that Christ will have us do to a generation that don't know him. I believe that the word of God has blessed you and challenged you today. I want to encourage you. We have a mentoring academy where we can take time to equip you some more. So if you're looking to study further with me, I will encourage you to email me today to join my mentoring academy. Let me also mention if you live in a place where there's no Bible teaching church where Christ is revealed, a church where you can learn the things you're learning from me here, you can start one in your community. You can start one in your locality. And if you want to start one, we can train you, equip you, and work with you until a campus, that's what we call our churches, a campus is launched in your community. You're not learning all of these truths to just sit down somewhere. You're learning them so you can also teach others. Brother Paul said to Timothy, the things you have learned and heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall in turn commit to others. Everything you're learning, is so that you can also be a blessing to other people. Remember, blessed to be a blessing. So if you want to start a campus today or you want to join one, send me an email, Damina at yahoo.com. We love you. Remember, we are live every day, 12 noon GMT plus one, 6 p.m. GMT plus one, 
and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. You don't want to miss what God is doing at this season, equipping and preparing people that will take this gospel to the ends of the earth. We love you and look forward to hearing from you. And until we connect in the next broadcast, enjoy the grace of Christ. Amen.